I see the King of glory coming on the clouds with fire. The whole earth shakes, the whole earth shakes, yeah. I see his love and mercy washing over all our sin. The, the people sing, the people sing. Hosanna, Hosanna, Hosanna. generation rising up to take their place with selfless faith with selfless faith I see a near revival stirring as we pray and see
Choo, choo, choo. I could use my loud voice, but this is probably a bit easier. There are some pretty strange clubs that exist in the world. That's a pretty big statement, I know. Um, many of us have been involved in some sort of club, whether it's a sporting club, you know, like a netball club or a, a soccer club or something like that, or maybe a community group like a Lions club or an Apex club or something like that. Many of us have been involved probably in many clubs over a number of years. But there are some really strange ones out there. There is the uh, luxurious flowing hair club for scientists. I'd love to be a part of that, but I'm not a scientist. I beg your pardon. <laughs> or the British Lawnmower Racing Association. That sounds like fun. I'd want to be part of that. Or, I think this one's made for bribey residents, by the way. The Roundabout Appreciation Society. <laughs> Plenty of potential members in the congregation this morning, I think. Most of us have been part of some kind of club over the years, perhaps still. And, uh, and you'd know that it's not always rosy, being in part of a, a group of people trying to achieve goals and accomplish things. But generally speaking, there is something very special about achieving goals together, right? There's something very special about celebrating together. Um, so, you know, maybe you, you can't get on the footy field, but you can be a supporter. You can get behind your team, you know, and you can celebrate when they win unless you're a Bronco supporter and then you, you just don't get to do that. <laughs> not at the moment, anyway. But it's great to be able to celebrate victory together. And I think most of us would agree that unity is much better than division. I remember not so long ago, I was actually on a plane and uh, watching one of those little tiny screens, you know. And uh, I was watching this Apollo 11 sort of movie documentary thing. Maybe some of you have seen it. And it had a lot of new footage on it. And, and I saw uh, this moment where Neil Armstrong put his you know, foot on the moon and, and they sort of cut away to all these different nations, all these people, you know, celebrating. And there's this sense of unity, you know, this unique sense of kind of unity and celebration that crossed the nations. And, of course, you know, Cold War notwithstanding, um, it was something that was very, very special. And, an, and really a, a massive contrast to the division that we saw in the wars earlier in the century. In my, uh, in my three-day-a-week role, uh, I work with Operation Mobilisation, or OM, which is a, a mission organisation. And as part of that, uh, I do training, uh, intercultural training online. And uh, I have students that are located in a number of places around the world, in Norway, Sweden, US, uh, a number of different places. But also from Asia, uh, South Asia, Southeast Asia, Hong Kong. And we talk a lot about cultural values. In order to, uh, I guess, to, to function better in our intercultural teams and also so we can minister to people in different cultures as well. And we do an exercise where we talk about what do you love and what do you struggle with about your home culture? And, and Westerners, myself included, often talk about how we struggle with individualism and especially the loneliness that it leads to in our societies. And I think it's really difficult if you spend time in Asia or in one of those places where there's that collectivist culture and you eat together, you celebrate together, you party together, you live together and then you come home to Australia and you hide behind your six-foot fences and you don't know your neighbours. All right? It, it should make us weep, I think. If God has designed us for community, then it's quite natural that we should desire it and miss it when it's taken away from us. When I think about unity, I think about Jesus praying his high priestly prayer in the Garden of Gethsemane on the night of his arrest. John 17, 20 to 21, it says, I do not ask for these only, he's talking about his disciples there, but also for those who will believe in me through their word, which is... Us. Yes, someone had it. The church. That they may all be one, just as you, Father, are in me and I in you. That they also may be in us, so that the world may believe that you have sent me. I think that's a pretty loud ringing endorsement from God that unity is a good and godly thing. It reflects the nature of the triune God himself and that makes a unified church a very powerful witness to the world. And of course, too often we've seen that a divided church is quite another matter entirely. In the Genesis account I want to focus on this morning, we discover a people who have a considerable desire for unity. You have a, have a desire for unity, and in fact they have um, 
uh, I guess, a number of facets of unity already in their, in their incorporation. Uh, Genesis 11, 1 to 2 says, Now the whole earth had one language and the same words. And as people migrated from the east, they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. Now we need to know that these people are the communities that stem from the lineage of Noah after the flood. Okay? So the previous chapter informed us of the various descendants of Shem, Ham and Japheth. Uh, God's command to Adam and Eve to fill the earth in Genesis 1.28 was effectively repeated to Noah and his sons in Genesis 9.7 when he said, And you be fruitful and multiply, increase greatly on the earth and multiply in it. Of course, these communities of people grew and the land that was available for them to inhabit was, was seemingly endless. They're one people, they have one language. And we see in verse 2 of our text that they decided instead of continuing to tr travel and to spread out like God had said, they decided to stop and make a home in the plain of Shinar. And so believe it or not, already in, 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 this, uh, very, in these opening verses, uh, we have these two subtle clues that all is not right within this group of people. And the first one is a quirk of language. And unfortunately, the, um, the ESV translation I have here do doesn't do a particularly great job of translating the Hebrew text uh, the NIV actually puts it better, where it says that the people moved eastward. Uh, that sounds really important, doesn't it? <laughs> well, it is important because the Bible doesn't make uh, any of these kind of statements without reason. So there's this little geographical kind of detail. And what we see if we look at the rest of the Genesis narrative, that when Adam and Eve were cast out of the garden, they were cast out eastward, east of Eden. When Cain was given a mark and sent away, in which direction was he sent? When Abraham and his nephew Lot stood together and Lot decided to go in a particular direction, what direction was that? Eastward. Eastward. John Salhammer, the commentator and author, says, In the Genesis narratives, when man goes east, he leaves the land of blessing, that is Eden and the promised land, and goes to a land where the greatest of his hopes will turn to ruin, as in Babylon or Sodom. The second clue, which I touched on already, uh, that tells us that not everything is right with these, with these people is that they were told to scatter and fill the earth. And what have they done in verse 2? They've settled. And you can understand why they would want to do that, right? That they would want to uh, create a community. They have this desire for, for community and unity, which we've already said in principle is a very good thing. But it's not a good thing that is happening here because they are defying the express will of God. So it doesn't really matter how good their alternative plan seems to them. It's not God's expressed will for them. And, and, and it can be that way for us, can't it? How many times does something seem like a good idea to us? It seems like a good idea. And later you realise it wasn't such a good idea. And definitely it is not, if it's not consistent with God's desire, we know that it can't possibly be good. I remember a young lady came to me and said, um, uh, I've been... I began dating this guy. I said, oh, wonderful. Tell me about him. And she says, oh, he's married. I said, oh, that, that's, that's interesting. Um, she said, he, he's, he's telling me that the marriage is nearly over, so, you know, we can start dating now. And I said, what do you think? And uh, she already knew. She already knew, but she did it anyway. It might seem like a good idea to marry someone you have fallen in love with. It might seem like a good idea to take up a new job. It might seem like a good idea to attend a new church. Are those things wrong in themselves? Of course not. I've done them all, probably most of you have. But if that other person is already married to someone else, that's, that's a bit of a problem, isn't it? God's not going to bless that. And that's going to bring a lot of pain. If the new job is morally compromising... God's not blessing that. If you're attending the new church because you wreaked havoc at the last one, a few nervous looking faces there. God will oppose that too. It may even be that it's not necessarily sinful or intrinsically wrong, but that God has a different role for you to play in his story. As we will see, there are many reasons why God is opposing the people here in this story. But we mustn't overlook the fact that in verses 1 and 2, already there are these layers of disobedience that undermine anything that might otherwise appear good. And I think that's so significant because many of the messages and the stories that we hear in society promote a form of unity that, that we can't be a part of, uh, but we might be tempted to be a part of. 
And, uh, you know, sometimes we just don't want to be the one that sticks out, you know, to be the, to be the one causing the, the problem. Um, so, of course, we can't say that love is love when that definition of love is opposed to God's. We can't go and get drunk with our mates, even if we've worked really hard that week and kind of felt like it. It's not even our call, though, is it? It's God's call. Because our life is hidden in Christ, right? It's God's call. He's our Lord. That's what lordship is, right? That these things are God's call. And we see that in Genesis 11. It's not their call to make. It's God's call. And they are taking up this posture in opposition to him. And it's really not where we want to find ourselves, is it? And if we do find ourselves in that position, we need to ask ourselves, how did we get there? Why has this happened? Because usually it's not because God has moved. It's because we have. And sometimes we just have to ask God by his Holy Spirit to realign our hearts and our desires, to remind us of our first love, and to repent if we need to. He's called us out to be a distinct people, a holy people. And holy means set apart, set apart for God, to be different, different in a good way. But we can unite ourselves so easily to things that oppose God, in spirit, in mind, or flesh. Things that might even seem good, but are beneath or opposed to our new identity. So in verses 3 and 4, they said to one another, Come, let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they had brick for stone and bitumen for mortar. And they said, Come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower with its top in the heavens. And let us make a name for ourselves, lest we be dispersed over the face of the whole earth. Now, somewhat understandably, they wanted to urbanise, much as we do, right? They wanted a home uh, that they could call their own an economic and spiritual hub. I mean, we do that too, right? We have our shopping centres, our places of worship. We live near each other so we can share services and keep costs down. We have running water, we have sewage, we have power. And it's so easy to take those things for granted. One of the things I feel especially blessed by are wheelie bins. I love wheelie bins. For 20 years, I had to take my stinky, maggot-infested bags of rubbish into the back of the car to the dump every Sunday morning. So to move into a place with a wheelie bin, I thought, this is like heaven on earth. It's wonderful. Of course, as soon as we moved out, they got wheelie bins, but anyway, that's another story. But statistically, about 60% of the world live in urban areas that, I guess, by the very nature of that, ensure a degree of community and unity our individualism notwithstanding. But the desire of the people in our text is much greater than that. It's not to gather as a people of God in submission to him. It is to make a name for themselves, we see in verse 4. Much like we do today, I guess, you know, trying to outdo each other with our highest towers, or highest buildings and longest bridges. But this, this building they wanted to build, this tower, is what they called a, a ziggurat, something which was very common in the day, in fact. And unlike the pyramids of the Egyptians, it wasn't a, a hollow uh, kind of um, centre where they could store the... So I struggled with this in the first message to this morning. What's the plural of sarcophagus? Sarcophaguses. That's where they store their sarcophaguses in, inside these pyramids, right? And, and all their other stuff and, and all the other people they had to kill because they died and all the rest of it. But the ziggurat, this Tower of Babel, is not like that. It was this solid structure that was stepped. And why do you think it was stepped? So God could come down and have coffee with these human beings who were just so close to God. If that's true, how are they conceiving of God? Really, I mean, here God, pop down and, uh, yep, we'll share a coffee. And so God is just like him, hey. Man shapes God in his own image. And instead of the reverse being true, that, that man acknowledges that he's made in the image of God, what we call the Imago Dei, man's plans reveal this small conception of God making himself equal with God and able to share the heavenly and the earthly realms with him. And people have always done that, haven't they? In fact, I think from time to time we probably all do it, try and reduce God down to this conceptually manageable being. Remember the times in the Bible, though, when people trembled in the presence of God? You know, you think of Samson's parents, particularly his father. He's, we're going to die because we've seen the angel of the Lord. Or the people at Mount Sinai, and they, 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 couldn't, they came to this mountain and they dare not go too close to the mountain because they knew they would die. 
Only Moses could touch the moon. Or John on the island of Patmos, when Jesus appears to him, post-resurrection, Jesus appears to him, and he's terrified. He's terrified. Yeah, Jesus is our brother, he's our friend, we're no longer enemies. But we should have that awe of him still. His majesty is so beyond our comprehension. That's the God we serve. The God who built his church. Those of you who are familiar will remember Solomon when he, when he built this grand temple. And at the dedication, he said, the heavens cannot contain you, let alone this building that I have built, this temple that I have built. And so we see by contrast the audacity of man to minimize and belittle God and make himself God. And it's because of such things that judgment ultimately is coming. And we see just that occurring in our text from verse 5. And the Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the children of man had built. And the Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they have all one language. And this is only the beginning of what they will do, and nothing that they propose to do will now be impossible for them. Come, let us go down and confuse their, la- confuse their language, so they may not understand one another's speech. Now, parenting is a tough job, isn't it? How many parents have we got in the room? Heaps. Heaps of parents, some of you are grandparents, maybe even great-grandparents, I don't know. <laughs> I say that respectfully. But it's so different to parent a baby, isn't it, that a two-year-old or a ten-year-old or a teenager or teaching them to drive, that's another story. But I remember a few years ago deciding to change the schools that my kids went to. And it was a really difficult decision because they'd lived in the community all their lives, we'd been in the community for a very long time, it meant um, inconvenience, more cost in time, money. But I was increasingly concerned by the behaviours and the values that were being taught and the way that they were beginning to rub off on my kids. And so it was a very hard conversation. It was a very difficult decision to make. It was painful in the short term. But ultimately I had to impose my will on my children for their long-term benefit. Any of you who are parents can undoubtedly think of many examples when you've had to do similar things, like taking a knife off a toddler or... Other, other types of things. And I think there are dimensions of, our, of my relationship with God which I really didn't understand so well until I became a father and, and wrestled with what it meant. When I disciplined my son, I, I got to ask God, do I need to be disciplined? Am I extending grace to them in a way that models the grace that I've experienced from Christ? Well, we actually see that grace in the form of discipline and judgment from God at Babel. We also hear this mocking tone from the author in verse 5. It says, the Lord came down to see. The Lord came down to see. Could the Lord see it already? Of course he could. This tower that had its top in the heavens is so short that God stoops down. And it's like, just hand me my glasses. I can't, I can't see it. Where is it? When I was in Dubai, I visited the Burj Khalifa and I stood at the bottom because I was too tight to pay for the observation deck. It was pretty expensive, by the way. 829 metres high, this thing. You know, it's quite, quite incredible. Maybe some of you have, have experienced that. Or, or similarly, just looked up at these huge skyscrapers and you think, man, that's high. And I could just imagine God looking at that, who you know, crafted the universe, who by his word spoke Mount Everest and the entire universe into being, going, oh, I think I can see it down there somewhere. The hubris of man. And so God sees that the people have desired a unity that exalts their own name, that seeks to dwell in the heavens as gods, and that openly defies his plan for the world. And he sees that this is only the beginning of what they will do. And and you think, well, we consider how quickly mankind filled the world with depravity, that God sent the flood, and this was happening just a few generations after the flood. So, So what will happen? What will it look like if God does not intervene at this point? Can you picture what that might have been like? So the Lord dispersed them from over the face of all the earth and they left off building the city. Therefore its name was called Babel because there the Lord confused the language of all the earth. And from there the Lord dispersed them over the face of all the earth. 
Now, a word about Babel, incidentally, it's not where we get the term Babel from, contrary to popular opinion. And so we do get this mixture of pronunciations, people say different things. And the Hebrew, of course, is different again. But Babel preempts Babylon. This is all taking place in, in the region of Babylonia. And we know that Babylon ultimately takes the Israelite nation captive uh, and many other occurrences throughout Scripture. But in Revelation, we see it epitomize the evil and the, the atrocities of the kingdoms of the world. Babylon the Great, the mother of prostitutes and of earth's abominations. Revelation 17.5, the one drunk with the blood of the saints, the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And this great city represents the godless folly and the opposition to God and will come under the final judgment of God. But here back in verses 8 and 9, we see a judgment of grace. The final verse tells us that the Lord dispersed the people, which if you think back to verse 4, was the very thing they were hoping to avoid, right? Let's do this so we don't get dispersed. And God says, no, I, I'm going to disperse you. It's like God's saying, you don't, you don't know what's good for you, so I'll give it to you against your will. And so the people at Babel sought security. They wanted to set up shop and have things on their own terms. And they were very comfortable with rejecting God's will. And he decided to graciously act in power to change the status quo. And that brings me to this point of sort of asking God, am I bold enough to say, Lord, come and change the status quo if I need correction. Are we corporately as a, as a congregation, as a church, prepared to say, Lord, come and change the status quo if we need correction? Because we don't always see it, but God sees it. So we ask that he corrects us in grace. At Pentecost, God, by the Holy Spirit, made his message intelligible to people of, of many linguistic backgrounds and is considered by many commentators as the reversal of Babel. After Pentecost, as the church grew, it remained Jerusalem-centric, despite Jesus saying, take the gospel to the ends of the world. Of course, they did scatter, but only because persecution came and they took the story of salvation then with them. And what troubles me, friends, is that much of the world does not know Jesus. I'll put my OM hat on for a moment. And of course, that includes Australia, it includes Bribey as well. God has told us as his church to spread out and fill the world with the knowledge of the kingdom, not dissimilar to his command in Genesis. The good news will be preached to the ends of the earth and the end will come. And it's not going to happen at the rate that we are doing that right now. We're nowhere near it. So what is God going to do to scatter us, to scatter the church? I wonder. Satan wants the church to be comfortable. He wants it to be docile and enjoy this kind of unity that is self-seeking and in opposition to God. That's the sin of Babel. And we're not to be a people in unity with the spirit of Babel, but with the spirit of the living God. We can hold unity up as a, as a virtue, but it's not inherently good, nor is it inherently bad. Unity of Nazi socialists is bad. Unity of God's people is good, usually, but it depends what unites them. What kind of unity will we have here in this church? Well, I think largely by way of contrast, by way of seeing what not to do, our text points, out, points us towards some considerations. I think firstly, our text makes really clear that God desires a community of people that are submitted to his lordship that our individual and corporate wills and decisions must come under his direction and not be allowed to spring from our own desires. Not what seems good to us, but what God wills for us. If God is gracious, he will frustrate us when we deviate. But do we not want to be a people who delights him and is pleasing to him? Secondly, we are not to be a people who seek to make a name for ourselves, but to be a people who exalt his name above our own to ascribe worth to him, worship. As I've long told musicians on, on these types of stages, this, this is not an audience. God is the audience. These are the worshippers. We're like the, when you go to the, the, you know, the, the musicals and, the, and the, the bands in the pit, you can't even see them half the time. They facilitate the singing. And so as we worship, we worship to an audience who is our Heavenly Father. By extension, we recognise that pride will divide us and humility towards Christ and each other will unite us. Uh, James, quoting the Old Testament, 
reminded us that God opposes the proud but gives grace to the humble. And so we ask, Lord, keep us humble before one another. And as Paul wrote elsewhere, thinking of ourselves, uh, thinking of others as more important than ourselves. I really got the wrong way around. Next, we are people who, are, who have security in our unity with God. Therefore, we understand our identity as his people. Help us, Lord, not to make decisions out of fear, but to be secure in you. We know who and whose we are. We can trust his plans for us are good and justice will prevail. And so in that we affirm what we call his sovereignty. We accept that he may prosper or refuse our plans. And we accept all from the hand of God wherever he chooses to take us. We accept his providence. And I think there's so much more that we could draw out, but I don't want to strain the the application of our text too much this morning. But friends, there is incredible power in a unified community on fire for the purposes of God. But it's so easy for us to settle and it's so easy for us to unify on lesser things. We must see him as he is and be captured by the awe of him. To be content to be under his lordship, to worship him, to make his name great, to humbly submit to each other, understand who and whose we are before him, to acknowledge his sovereignty and his hand of providence. And above all, we know his love and we share it with those around us. If they are the hallmarks of this community, what might that look like? Can you picture what that might look like? And what the impact of that might be in transforming lives as people come to know and hear that Jesus loves them, that Jesus died on the cross for them. They don't have to strive anymore. They don't have to try and be good enough. They can just fall at his feet and worship him and their lives are changed. One right here. I want to see that. Do you want to see that? Do you want to see that? Can you imagine this church continuing to grow not only in numbers but in depth of faith and godly character and unity and the impact that can have for the kingdom of God? So where are we weak? What do we need to address? What do we need to cry out to God for to help us, to continue to grow us and build us? There's a lot of things we do well. And I'm pretty new to this community, so I'm just making a lot of assumptions here too, I'm sure. But we all are weak in certain areas and we must ask God to work in us as individuals and as part of the whole to go to work on us, to strengthen us, to grow us. As I close, I'm just going to give us some, a few moments of silence. Let's ask that question of the Lord this morning. Lord, I as part of the whole, as part of your body, Lord, desire unity. What needs to change in me? Is there something I see from this text, Lord, that helps me understand what needs to change in me to help fulfill this beautiful picture of unity that Jesus prayed about? Lord, do that work in us. Help us not to be afraid. Help us not to withhold from you. Open our hearts. Be malleable. Suffer the the pruning that might need to take place. That we would bear fruit. That you would be honoured and glorified and Lord, that lives would be changed. Here and across the world, Father, we pray that you would do that work in us. Let's just reflect now. Oh, Lord, you love your people. You love your church. 
Just thank you so much for this church. I thank you that you've changed so many lives already in this place. And we love you and we thank you. We thank you, Lord, that you don't leave us as we are, but you continue to transform us, to conform us to the image of Christ, to make us more like him every day. Lord, let us be so much like Christ when people see us, they see Christ. As we interact with the world around us, as we hold out hope, not in a pious or self-righteous way, but Lord, as people who have just experienced your grace and had your love showered upon us, we experience something, Lord, that we would never ever dream of that could be so good. Lord, let us look like that as individuals and as a body, Lord, let us be a great shining light in this place. Lord, we can only do that with your power and your strength. Lord, just keep us in the center of your will. Lord, help us not to deviate. Be gracious to us and correct us when we need it. Lord, help us to love each other, to consider our words, to consider the things that we might say or write or whatever the case may be. Lord, help us just to be living in that harmony as best we can in the sinful world. Father, help us, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. invite the band back up. song is um, part of the evening church services repertoire, and I'm introducing it to you now. Um, I suppose this would definitely help us understand our unity as a church, to we can sing the same songs together, despite meeting different times, and often many of us not being in the same place. There's a grace when the heart is under fire. Another way when the walls are closing in. And when I look at the space between where I used to be and this reckoning, I know I will never be alone. There was another in the fire standing next to me. There was another in the Holding back the seas And should I ever need reminding Of how I've been set free There is a cross that bears the burden Where another died for me There is another in the fire My dad left for dead beneath the waters. I'm no longer a slave to my sin anymore. And should I fall in the space between what remains of me and this reckoning, either way I won't bow to the things of this world. Another.
see the light in the darkness as the darkness bows to him i can hear the roar in the heavens as the space between where thin i can feel the ground shake beneath us as the prison walls cave in nothing stands between us nothing stands between Jesus, he who was and still is and will be through it all. So come what may in the space between all the things unseen and this reckoning, I know I will never be. Thank you again for this opportunity to meet and gather and worship. Lord, to hear your word and to respond to it. Father, we just praise you. You are good. Lord, that your judgment is gracious upon us, Lord. And uh, Father, I pray that all that you have spoken to us, different things to different people, we know, Lord, as you apply it by your Holy Spirit. Let us go. Let us be pleasing to you in the strength of Jesus Christ and by his Holy Spirit. We pray it in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. If anyone would like prayer, feel free to come forward and... Um, Pastor Drew and myself would really, would really love to pray for you and chat with you. Bless you. Awesome. Next. There is-